Thank you for, for having a, a chat with us. We're here to talk about uh, transmission, which is about to screen uh, at, at Frightfest. How are you How are you feeling about being selected and the screening itself? I'm very honoured to be accepted, obviously. I've sort of, um, funnily enough, been jealous about Frightfest for many years because a lot of my friends have had films at Frightfest over the years. And I've always been making the kind of stuff that doesn't get into festivals, you know, because it doesn't need to or because it's, you know, not that kind of movie. And so, you know, I grew up with people like Ben Wheatley and um, Johannes Roberts and Howard Ford and Jonathan Glendening and all these people. We all grew up together in Brighton. We used to make films together when we were like 11, 12, 13 years old, all of us. And so I'm, I've always been the one that's sort of a bit of a black sheep because I never had a film at Fright Fest and everybody else has. And I felt very jealous every year when Fright Fest came around. But when you're making films for like the, the sci-fi channel or something, they don't want to screen at Fright Fest. They don't need to. They don't want to. So I never had the chance until this uh, opportunity now. So I'm very honoured to be involved and I'm very nervous because um, the uh, sort of nerve wracking thing about a film is you can't change it now, you know. Yeah. So it's going to it's going to have its fate decided for it at Fright Fest and I will be there. But there's nothing I can do to influence uh, people's decision making. You know, if people like it, great. And if they don't, I'll be uh, you gutted. That's just the way it is. I have to ask. I've got a friend who's obsessed with him. I'll I'll be like disowned. What was the teenage Ben Wheatley like? Oh, uh, crazy! He never used to wear shoes. Okay. He often he refused to wear shoes for a long time, and um, he was kind of crazy, but uh, obviously very super creative guy and everything. And then he, he um, was taking an art degree. And I was the kickboxing champion of England at the time. So I was a sort of tough guy back then. And uh, Ben's uh, thesis uh, art project was me beating him up oh. in the ring. I took him to my kickboxing gym and I got permission from my uh, sensei to have him in there. And, uh, and I beat him up. And that was, that was his uh, thesis project for his art degree. So um, Ben was always crazy. Yes, and now he's you know he's wrestling gigantic megalodons. Um, yes, yes, yeah, he's a, he's, a, he's come a long way since those days of not wearing his shoes. I think he wears shoes now. Well, I'd hope so. You know, with those uh, with those uh, megalodons swimming around, it's uh, yeah, so not with clippers. I don't know, but he's uh, he's he's been a friend of us for years, and uh, and fun enough, we we made a film together. The, the film that doesn't get any attention at all, and you know perhaps rightfully so. But my brother and I and a friend of ours called Robin Hill made a film called Project Assassin years ago, back in 1998, that we self-financed and very, very much the same way I made Transmission. I, I've sort of come full circle, you know, self-financing stuff. And we made a film called Project Assassin and we made it for about £20,000. And we took it to the Cannes Film Festival and it was seen by a producer who worked with Roland Emmerich and they bought it for half a million dollars. And they brought us out to Hollywood. My brother got some, my brother got like a $7 million movie to make in Germany because of it. And I got a $2 million film to make in Canada because of it. And Project Assassin uh, featured Robin Hill, but it also had Howard Ford of The Deg was involved in it. Ben Wheatley was the storyboard artist for it back in the day. Andy Stark, who's now become Ben Wheatley's producer and produced uh, Brandon Cronenberg films, he edited it, Project yeah. Assassin. So Project Assassin was almost like the nexus of all of our Brighton mm -hmm. efforts. And because we were young at the time, we were like 22, 23 at the time and got this Hollywood deal. I think Project Assassin inspired everyone else from that Brighton group to carry on making films. I know it inspired Ben to make Down Terrace. Nice. Because yeah. that was Project Assassin was this thing that, you know, had gone from being a 20 grand home movie to a half million dollar Hollywood movie. So even though no one ever heard of it, only got, any of it got released in Germany in the end. Um, so it, it's as a film, it's a film between the cracks. But as an inspiration to all that Brighton group, Project Assassin is kind of a really quite important film, I think. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I'm gonna. I quite like the fact I got some trivia to tell my my Wheatley fan that she might not know. Yeah, no, no one knows about him being a storyboard artist for Project Assassin. That's for sure. That's a very obscure credit. And that so transmission. It's it's a bit of a strange one. It's like the first channel surfing horror horror film. Yeah. Um, for those that haven't read upon read upon the film, um what's kind of like the elevator pitch or have I just, have I just done the it? The elevator pitch is just that, you know, imagine you were sitting there in, on, on TV and it was midnight and you're channel surfing because you're bored between different channels and you suddenly start to get the gradual dawning realisation that everything you're watching is actually connected and every time you're changing channel you're just seeing a different perspective of the same story and the same story has somehow taken over every channel and it's not good for you as the viewer. That's the, uh, that's the sort of horrific pitch of it and stuff and that's, you know, it's, 
inspired by many late nights of watching TV and channel surfing. I was going to say, you know, the research for that must have been, you know, quite... quite... Exhaustive and about 35 years of it, yeah. <laughs> and it's such an intricate story, you know, you say it's like it's channel surfing and that, but that must have been an absolute nightmare to sort of like get get your head around was it did you did you write it as as it screens or was it more that you sort of focused in on each section and then worked out how to intercut them all together I, I that's a good point I mean I wrote it as a screenplay so it was an 85 page screenplay and final draft but it had a completely different shape so the stories were all intact and I, I and I filmed all the stories you know the spaceship story and the new story and everything I filmed it all and then the way it was all intercut was utterly changed from the paper version completely because it became really clear from a sort of narrative standpoint that the really important thing is when you start crossing the streams in Ghostbusters terms you know and that's the that was the thing that really affected whether people liked the film or not uh for instance in the in the um well I don't want to give too many spoilers away but I'll tell you a major spoiler is that at the 50 page mark of the screenplay on paper that's when you first realized the missing film director had made the sci-fi movie and that was just too long for people to wait. When they're watching these spaceships and they're watching these spacemen, they needed to know that there was going to be a point to them drifting through space and having their adventures. They needed to know that was going to tie in. So I moved that way forward in the edit, basically, to mm. about the 10 minute mark, I think it is now. Yeah. And I think there are these, you know, they're flicking through, there's a, there's a evangelicist um, sort of sermon going on. Yeah. There's, that's the one, televangelist. Um, there's a, the sci-fi movie there's a documentary there's a puppet show there's uh 80s slash 90s sort of teen comedy throwback you know that's that's a lot of plates how did you sort of like did you did you focus on them them each separately when it came to shooting did you have a particular a particular favorite that you know you preferred sort of working with uh they were all difficult in their own ways obviously they're all nightmares but um, no, we, we filmed them in, in blocks, as you would imagine. So it was like an anthology film, basically. We filmed the sci-fi out first, and then we filmed the news out second. And then we filmed the documentary over the longest period of time, because that was lots of pickup shoots and extra shoots and stuff. Like, I'm in the film, like, 15 times. You know, there's, there's, loads, of, there's loads of scenes in transmission that I filmed on my own with nobody else around. Um, so, uh, yeah, we did the documentary as a sort of overarching section. And then the, uh, the silly comedy was one day. So yeah, we, we we kept it in blocks for the sake of ease and and not going too insane. And like I say, they the, they were all separate shoots. It was like making five short films, but the way they were intercut is the key. And that took the longest time. That was a year of post production and rethinking and re editing and rejigging and stuff. And that's what I'd never had before as a filmmaker, um, because I used to work in the sort of one to two million dollar range. That's too much money to let anybody be experimental. That's too yeah. much money to allow anyone to have a year in the edit room to see what they can come up with. And so everything I've ever made before has been edited as fast as possible because there's a bank loan pending, you know, on the movie's budget and there's interest being paid. And so, the, and, or, and oftentimes in stuff I've done before, there's an air date already decided, you know, uh, to come out on the sci-fi channel or whatever. So every post-production process I've ever had has been incredibly truncated for, you know, economic reasons. And this was the one time when no one was looking over my shoulder. No one was expecting transmission. Nobody wanted transmission. I was forcing it upon the world. And so in that instance, I had like a real year in post, which I've never had before and probably never have again, you know, unless I sell finance another movie. And that's, you know, to my mind, my biggest filmmaking education about transmission. I found out a bunch of stuff about filmmaking that I didn't know before because I had the time to really dig in and re-edit and even reshoot and do pickup shoots and so on and so forth. I mean, the thing about making a super low budget film was it's almost closer to the massive budget model that Hollywood uses because Hollywood, as you know, does loads of reshooting all the time and pickup shots and re-edit. But if you do a $2 million sci-fi channel movie, there's no pickup shoots, there's no reshoots, there's nothing there. that's not, impossible. So you either have a budget where you can sustain that because you're paying millions of dollars and the studio doesn't care, or you have no budget at all and you can do whatever you want. But I've always been stranded in that mid-budget range where you can't afford to mess about, but you really wish you could. And uh, there are many of my films I would go back and re-edit and reshoot and do pickup shoots for. Especially now, I've seen the massive effect it can have on a story. Yeah, because I mean, the editing is it, its sort of key in a way with, with it being told across several different formats. There's no... 
sort of traditional narrative pacing and that obviously all comes through the edit with how long you you stay on each program and then you know in some places maybe the flicking gets a little bit faster and then just that on its own brings in that tension and sense of urgency for the viewer so yeah it must have been you know a lot of painstaking hours trying to work out which way through exactly and exactly and that's i mean the, the really weird thing is the editor of the movie is kind of a character in the movie because he is the viewer by definition and so the editor's deciding when the viewer as a character gets bored mm. and decides he wants to know, learn something else or you know it was really uh, a, a very iterative process and trial and error and so on and so forth and there are many different versions of the movie like i say which is cut completely different from each other but always from the same footage you know we didn't go back and reshoot that much it was always the same footage the same stories about how they connected how they interconnected and when and when and which when and where you change channels turned out to be the most important creative decision of the whole movie yeah i mean my my personal favorite is um without too many spoilers is the the kids show the the puppets <laughs> they, they they very much sort of work as they're almost speaking to the to the audience in a way it's like but there's this puzzle I don't see how all these pieces come together and then like the next time it's like oh but there's you know it's it's starting to come together and it, it, it is it's sort of like speaking to the audience going no it's okay you know it, this picture is sort of like becoming becoming clear I think that's a really a really nice addition and as somebody with a four-year-old I'm, I'm very familiar with you know late night children's television it's really weird that's how you that's weird thing about channel surfing especially at sort of two in the morning three in the morning there's this weird intersection where they are playing a really gory horror movie on one channel but they're also anticipating that toddlers are waking up yeah and and so there's stuff on for mums, you know, at three in the morning, you know, like Yo Gabba Gabba and stuff. So that, I thought that was a really strange intersection. And you're right, we used the puppets as a Greek chorus. And funnily enough, that was the one note that really helped me from Johannes Roberts. He's uh, he lives near me now, but he used to live near me in Brighton, and now he directs, you know, forty seven meters down and uh, Resident Evil movies and stuff. And he came to my house and watched it at my house. He was one of the few people that came over. And he said, uh, you've got to move the moment where the puppets say, are you sure this will all fit together way earlier? It came at about 35 minutes or 40 minutes when he saw the movie. And he was like, no, that's the clue I needed from that kind of Greek chorus mm. that the puppets are. That's the clue I needed that I wasn't going to get entirely lost. And it wasn't going to be too frustrating to watch this movie. So that we moved the puppets way earlier, especially that line about how it's all going to fit together. Because you're right, it's weird how subconsciously it works. Like, you wouldn't think intellectually the fact that a puppet said that on another channel would mean anything. Yeah. But because you're an emotional creature and you're trying to piece things together, when a puppet who's got nothing to do with anything on any of the other channels happens to tell you, oh, don't worry, it's going to fit together. You take that as read and you, you, you ascribe that information to all the other channels automatically. Human yeah. beings are really weird. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean I've, I've got a kid, like, all I see is puppets. So, you know, that right. I believe anything they tell me these days, because, you know, they, yeah. they're my friends, <laughs> they're, they're right. my sort of conversation. But it must, have, it must have been so, so much fun getting to, like, mess around in, in all these genres, you know, the, the documentary format yeah. and the kids show and, you know, the, I guess the, the sort of the, the sci-fi action film, especially, I know, obviously, so, you know, you, you've worked in, in a number of films, it must have been nice to sort of almost poke fun at some of them in a way yeah yeah it was it was fun and, uh, you know uh you know it, it, i tell you i mean obviously i'm not saying this uh, true about the actors in the film transmission the sci-fi movie at all but i was kind of act i was after bad performances mm. I, I i wanted them to seem like an 80s movie like dark side of the moon or galaxy of terror i didn't want them to be good you know so we had um certain i mean i would choose takes you know because these are good actors i'm talking about i'm not insulting anybody i would choose takes where they were at their worst in terms of being slightly artificial and slightly uh, slightly over the top and everything else i would choose those takes because yeah, i wanted to ape this movie is a, a huge uh inspiration on the whole movie and indeed the accidental financier of the movie is uh, roger corman so the, well, I told everybody associated with the movie that uh, the uh, transmission, the sci-fi movie, was meant to look like Galaxy of Terror. I, I just said, what's it going to be like? Well, Forbidden World, Galaxy of Terror. Don't look at anything else. Don't worry about anything else. That's those, don't worry about Alien or Aliens. Just do Galaxy of Terror. And um, the silly little nutballs comedy was meant to be screwballs. Hmm. So I took two Roger Corman, uh, you know, templates and, and, and said to everybody, production designers and everything, anyone who was involved in the movie, because there was a revolving, you know, group of people in different different aspects of this movie. But I would say, you know, look at those Roger Corman things. And the funny thing was that the film was financed by Roger Corman, although he doesn't know it. 
because he hired me to write a screenplay a few years ago uh it's called death game 2084 which i hope will get made one day i wrote the script there and he paid me you know a surprisingly but a large amount of money for roger corman and i used all that money to finance transmission Oh, nice. I mean, see the, the actors. Obviously, you mentioned earlier that the, there is a link between the, the sci-fi movie and the, the subject of the, of the documentary. And you do see some cast members from that film in the documentary, and mm -hmm. it is a completely different performance. And you, you know, you can yeah. tell that you know they are deliberately, you know, in this thing. And you know, as a as a Terminator fan, you know, I'm still not sure if I quite forgive you for the uh, the the blatant homage. Uh, stealing of lines from from the terminator in that sci-fi film oh i've done worse than that you have to watch my time travel film paradox <laughs> that's got so many james cameron references i got in trouble with illegal about it oh wow yeah. um but yeah it's like i know I, I i i can forgive it in you know within within this within this world i'll let it off you know i don't always let stuff like that slide but you know i think that that's the other thing about it you are making nods and references to you know pre-established texts you know that Any, uh, anything where i referencing james cameron is is honestly worshiping at the altar of james cameron i've met him a few times he's my number one uh, director you know he's, he's he's the dude um yeah. i'm one millionth as talented as James Cameron so everything I'm doing is meant to be an homage and not uh, not yeah. taking the mick you know I wouldn't do that no but it's like it's like obviously in in, in nutballs as well there's you know like um fast times at Ridgemont High sort of like homage yeah, say anything in there as well yeah yeah and it's it, it, it's it's great for especially for an audience like Fright Fest who are very into their films not necessarily just just horror but across all genres to see these like little little nods and that because I think it helps sort of solidify these fictional works that you've made in a way it makes them feel more real because they are like oh that's like that film and that's like that film I know exactly although I'm not getting to watch the full 90 minutes of this film I know exactly what this film that I'm flicking in and out of is you know what that's true that's a good point yeah I mean, no film was ever to you know independent of any other film so it's true and if you can uh you know lay the groundwork and understand the connections between different films yeah it helps you not watch all of nutballs you don't need to see all of nutballs you know and if you were channel surfing across tv within two minutes you'd figure out oh yeah this is this is one of them you know um, so that's a very good point you're making. Yeah, it's a very meta film, as, as you know, by definition and by by its own very nature. And so the more people can bring to it in terms of uh, baggage and knowledge and so on and so forth, the more it will help them. Yeah, it's a film by a film fan for film fans. You know, I, I, I will say that about it. Yeah, and it's got the 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 late night slot, which obviously feels perfect because this is this isn't a film that you want to be watching first thing in the morning. Um, so I guess whilst fright festers are trying to make their decisions about what film they're going to watch when why should they why should they take a chance on on this one honestly I, you know my badge of honor to do with the movie is to do with its originality I, there's going to be a lot of films at fright fest that are going to be really well executed really well done well acted well shot and everything else but they are going to be familiar genre tropes that are going to be used and they are going to be familiar structures and if people want a chance take a chance on a movie with a completely different structure like it hasn't been done there is amazon women on the moon and there are there are a few things which has involved this kind of idea, but no one's ever used it narratively. No one's ever tied the thing together into one story before, and that hasn't been done before. And whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, you know, I, at least you can say with your hand on your heart, it's original. It hasn't been done, and so I would give people the you know the the pat on the back and say, please go and see this movie because it's something new. And if you don't like it, that's totally fair enough. But it's the only film at Fright Fest that hasn't been done before ever. And so that's that's my badge of honor for it. You know, uh, many, many films have higher budgets and, and bigger stars and everything. And I totally understand that. And believe me, there's a lot of films at Fright Fest I want to see. You know, there's some good stuff that I'm definitely I've asked for, you know, free tickets, you know, because I'm at the festival. I've asked for free tickets for a bunch of movies. There's a lot of great stuff there. But I think my film is the most original. Yeah, I mean, from what I've seen, that's, that's definitely true. So I will thank you for your time and wish you best to look at the festival. Thank you very much, Carrie. I really appreciate it.